at the age of seven, my family immigrates from Zimbabwe to Aotearoa, I pass through customs, but my culture is made to stay behind. A colonized compass renavigates this castaway. We sail across oceans on a new citizenship, Aotearoa, signs the right to my adoption when my motherland's arms grow too corrupt to cradle her own babies. She birthed babies C-sectioned out by diaspora doctor, mother and daughter. We've become estranged strangers chasing liberation and dreams of education on the land of milk and honey. But I'm a stranger to this country. In the classroom, I'm afraid my tongue will beat back to its African rhythm, be concussed by fear, have amnesia turn all its memories to dust. Yesterday I was African, today I am lost. Maybe I was blinded by the neon sign of opportunity, failed to read the fine print which read assimilate, or go back to where you came from. I have been led astray, like Eve to snake, like promises of wealth to the prodigal son. I am a child of the diaspora. A common thread amongst my people in the fabric of what displaces us from our homes. Sometimes it is by choice. Most often it is not. To be a child of the diaspora is to battle two tongues. Be forced to trade one for the other so much so that my articulation of the English language now tastes like the unbirthing of my country. When I travel back to Zimbabwe to reconnect with my roots, I feel I am a jigsaw piece in the wrong puzzle. It's an emptying feeling to become foreign to a country that was yours to begin with. I am beginning to forget the taste of my own language and home has become just a memory. So I wrote that poem um, because the concept of home is something which feels somewhat elusive to me. While I'm a resident to Aotearoa, coming from an immigrant family, I'm in a position which pushes me outside of both my social and cultural comfort zone. So like many immigrant parents, my parents migrated in search of quality education and success for their children. And when I think about how race affected me through all of that, right, I realized that at some point I started believing that in order to attain those aspirations which my parents desired for me, I had to assimilate and assume the values and behaviors of New Zealand culture and therefore neglect my own which were inherent to me as a black Zimbabwean. And unfortunately, that's a common mindset shift of many ethnic minorities. But I believe the power to re-empower those marginalized communities lies within the hands of our educational institutions. And I'll provide you with an example. In Aotearoa, Māori students are falling behind on every measure of educational outcome. Secondary school level retention rate, school leavers achieving NCA level two, the rate of youth involved in education or employment. To me, it's clear that the enduring legacies of colonization are behind this ongoing disadvantage of our Māori people. And it is an unfortunate but yet reoccurring issue that students who belong to minority groups tend to feel as though they don't belong in an educational context because there are lower expectations of them. And in such a diverse community, it's so important that we have educational institutions which place a greater emphasis on history, language, and culture. Because when our educators are more informed on these topics, they enter the profession with a different perspective, right? one in which you're less likely to hold those racist or biased views. And it's no secret that when a student feels as though they belong in an educational context, they will perform better. And I, I truly believe that we can shift those educational inequalities if we cultivate culturally flexible minds and provide all students with the assurance that they have both the responsibility and the right to be there. There's a powerful novel titled Decolonizing the Mind. Let that title sit with you, Decolonizing the Mind. The novel speaks about the writer's time in colonial Kenya. It speaks of how, at the time, violence was a means of physical subjugation, right? While language was the means of emotional subjugation. And that was a really critical part of the suppression process, that the language of those being oppressed was dissociated from them. And what's particularly frightening to me about that is I see these same kinds of patterns echoing in today's society, particularly amongst our Māori community, as they have to live in fear of what is to become of their home when their language dis disappears completely. 
One of my favorite poets, Pages Matam, he describes language as being both a tool for communication and a vehicle for culture. And I find that to be such a beautiful description because language and words are saturated with history, culture, and memories. Language and words are powerful tools that we can employ to share our different perspectives because unity is derived from a better understanding of one another as people, right? So the best way that I know how to share the perspective of those I represent as a black immigrant woman is through my writing. So I make poetry and I choose to send it to the man who sat behind me on the train last week who had the audacity to touch my hair without asking. I didn't say anything, which is crazy because your girl almost always has something to say. <laughs> but in that moment, like my split ends, my mouth was almost too dry to speak. Luckily, my hair, my hair speaks volumes. Tangled and twisted, there are stories in these curls. Stories of a mother, father, sister, brother, stamped with a number, marked as object, sold as property. Stories of ancestors who were shackled in cages, displayed in zoos the same way you stroke me like an exhibit in a petting zoo. It's twisted and it's tangled, but there are stories in these curls, a beautiful possession of my history's oppression. And you look at me like I am Medusa's child, cursed. I'm making everyone blind to my self-worth, and for years I tried to strip myself of this curse with the potion of chemicals. Despite the burn of sodium hydroxide on my scalp, the smell of burning flesh that filled the room, I was hypnotized. At the prospect of having straight hair cascade this broken body of insecurity, hoping to put myself back together with glued and weave tracks, causing receding hairlines as I mentally recede back, back in time, to a time of my ancestors' inferiority, to a time of no authority, forever believing that I was the target minority, but you can't tell me to tame this mane, because in fact, you are the lion. And in this jungle where racism runs wild, I am your prey. You are my predator, devouring my history, leaving me so raw that my own flesh builds a grave for me to lie in. I'm buried deep in my roots. And I understand that I may be dead, but God, can you rehumanize the systematically dehumanized? Teach me to wear my hair fitted like a crown because tangled and twisted, I've got stories in these curls. So I wrote that poem about my experiences with possibly one of the worst forms of racism, and that is internalized racism, which operates as a system within itself, in which minority groups are unconsciously rewarded for behaving in ways which uphold whiteness and white supremacy. And in the words of Dr. King, somebody told a lie one day, they made everything black, ugly, and devil. There are people who truly come to believe these systemic lies that by constantly chemically straightening their hair or bleaching their skin, they're drawing closer to the ideal standard of beauty or success. And it's vital that we replace these lies of racial inferiorities with the truth of a shared humanity. In such a multicultural and diverse society, it's vital that we have media sources which are accurately portraying that representing people of color as the standard bearers of intelligence, success, professionalism, and beauty, along with their white counterparts. So dear racism, I am rewriting the history you gave me because I know the future belongs to those who prepare for it. And you have been preparing me for centuries. Thank you.